Welcome back to the Engineered Angler. Today we're going to make a lure that was suggested by a couple of folks a couple of times, and that's a darter lure. This is a, a kind of a lure that is typically used up in the Northeast, fishing off the beaches. Now I grew up in New Jersey and I never got a chance to use a lure like this. I never got a chance to fish for striped bass. I was fishing freshwater for largemouth bass and whatever else I could catch. So I'm going to do everything I can to make a replica of one that's legitimate and then we'll take it to the water and test it. See if it works the way they say it's supposed to work. So if that's something that you're interested in, stick around. So I gotta confess, I don't own a darter lure and I've actually never held one in my hand. So I, what I did was I got online, I, I downloaded a few pictures and I know a few facts about it. I know the length of the particular lure I was looking at. I know the weight of it. And since I had a photograph and a single dimension, I could scale it off and I can get all the other dimensions that I need. I also watched a couple of YouTube videos of people using them, people talking about how to use them. And I even watched an interview with the designer, which was kind of interesting. And I'll put a link to that in the description. So let me fill in all the other dimensions. All right, so these are all the critical dimensions, at least the ones I'm gonna be using. This one back here is the distance to the taper. This one here is the distance to the end of the flat spot. And then the rest are specific to the little cutout mouth part. So it should be obvious that I'm gonna be shaping this thing on the lathe. And that gives me some confidence that I'm gonna be able to reproduce the shape pretty well. And since I have the dimensions, I should be able to reproduce the uh, volume of it, which is a good thing for the engineering part because I know the weight of the lure or the weight it's supposed to be, which is two and three eighths of an ounce, which is right around 67 grams. And I'm, I'm assuming that's with the hooks and the hardware and everything, let's hope. But if I can reproduce the shape pretty well, then that weight should be pretty valid and I should be able to get the action of the lure to be like the original. Which brings us to the action. This lure is meant really to be fished in a current. It needs a good fast flow over the face to get this thing to give you that big wide zigzag motion it's supposed to have. But I'm assuming that I can replicate that current by just towing it behind the boat. The lure has a long flat spot on the top of the head that runs from here to the end and the tie and eye is all the way at the point practically and because this little notch at the very front it's going to have very little influence on the actual movement of the lure the lure is going to act a lot more like a banner in the wind with a little bit of influence from this flat spot and of course that notch as well that notch i suspect is there to get it moving down in the water and then the larger surfaces is what gives it the bigger movement I'll be using this piece of maple I cut from one of my trees back in 2018 and it's been drying in my shop ever since. So this should be a pretty straightforward shaping. I'm going to get it down to the maximum diameter and then we'll do the shaping from there which is very little. We'll taper the back and then it's just a matter of cutting off the front flush. And then we'll do the rest of the shaping off the lathe. I've got it tapered in and I've got it set up so I can just cut it off at the lake. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this off and I'll take it over to the bandsaw and cut it off.
pretty cool. All right, so I went ahead and marked out the line of where the flat spot on the top ends. And I'm going back and marking out the distance the flat spot ends on the back of the lure. And I'm gonna take this and cut it with the bandsaw. All right, so the trick to making a cut like this is to keep this thing vertical. That means not allowing this to rotate. So I put a little clamp on it so that I can just push it along the line and I know it's not gonna rotate around. All right, so now I've sketched in the little notched out area that forms sort of a, a little bit of a bib, and this is gonna be substantially more difficult to actually cut cleanly. The general shape is almost as good as I thought I could do. So the next thing is that typically this kind of lure has a through wire to connect the tie on eye and the belly eye and the tail eye. But I'm not a big fan of drilling all the way through a lure. I prefer to do the drop from the top technique, which essentially means cutting a groove instead of drilling a hole. I like it better because I have more control when I'm installing the wire and I can be pretty much guaranteed that I can seal the whole lure inside and out and be pretty sure that the lure isn't gonna get waterlogged anytime soon. So it's time to prep for the uh, two-part five-minute epoxy that I'm going to use to glue this stuff in. I'm mixing it in a little Ziploc bag that I'm going to use as a piping bag. It's a handy trick. You just snip off the corner and you get a real good opportunity to just jet this stuff down into the crevice. Really get a chance to fill it in and you're sure that you've fully glued this stuff in. Then it's just a matter of being sure you've got it full to the top and then sanding it back and smoothing it off. With the lure mounted on my holder, I can clean it up with some alcohol and get it ready for the first kind of sealing coat with UV resin. I use this more as a sanding sealer than really a clear coat. I put it on pretty thin and so it sets up in 20 to 30 minutes. And after that, I just give it a light sanding and we can get going on the next part. So yeah, two and three eighths ounces is 67.33 grams. So 56.4, and we need to be at 67.4, or 67.3 actually. So we need an extra 10 grams of weight. All right, there it is, 67.35. All right, that's, that's crazy accurate. So I'm gonna put uh, one of the big ones on either side of the hook hanger and then the other small one just forward of everything. There's one. All right, there's all three of them. So all I need to do is seal this holes up and I'll probably just use a little bit of uh, sawdust, some crazy glue and finish it off uh, with some UV resin. 
I've got the holes filled up with UV resin and I just need to sand it down flush. And then I'll put a primer coat of white on this thing. All right, that's two coats. That should do it. All right, well, here it is. Dressed in white, couple of coats of white primer, and then sanded with a 320 sandpaper. So I'm gonna go ahead and paint this thing a classic yellow paint job. I am gonna have one little difference. I'll, I'm gonna have a little bit of metallic white on the bottom, just a little bit, and then we'll paint the eyes on too. I'm gonna have to turn the air conditioner on and the extractor fan on too, so there's gonna be a lot of noise. So I'll just go ahead and paint and uh, I'll do a voiceover if I need to tell you anything. Traditionalists probably want to kill me with these anime eyes on this thing. Kind of looks like uh, Pikachu or one of those things. I do think it does look like a real darter. The color scheme, I think it's going to work. So I'm going to let it dry for a little bit. I'm going to spray it with polyacrylic clear, let that set, and then I'll put a clear coat on it. I think we got a decent result in spite of the drama that I had yesterday because just as I was turning the UV lights on I took a look at it and the uh, UV cure resin was just sort of glopping on it and wanting to sort of separate it was really weird hasn't happened to me in a long time so I just wiped it all off before it got hard uh, and then cured whatever residue was on there cleaned it back up and gave it another coat and I think now we got a nice finish. All right, it feels a lot heavier. I don't know why. Maybe it's just my mind, but 66 without the hooks and the split rings. Remember, we're shooting for right around 67 and a half. We're at 71, so we definitely overshot it with all the uh, resin on there. But hopefully, it, it's still a floater. Let's go ahead and put the hooks on, and we'll put it in a little float tank. All right, there she is. Just barely fits in here. Oh, yeah. Plenty floaty and pretty much floats pretty evenly. Yeah, it's got plenty of buoyancy. Those anime eyes might be uh, not everybody's cup of tea, I guess, but I think it looks pretty cool. And it's time to get out on the lake with this thing. Let's take it out on the boat. Hopefully the weather will hold and we'll be able to get some underwater shots. All right, I'll see you on the water. All right, here we are. Overcast, unfortunately. Hopefully we'll get a little bit of sunshine. It looks like it might want to break a little bit. The wind is out of the south, so I'm up in the lee of the south shore of this lake. Hopefully we'll be able to see a little bit into the water and I'll be able to show you how this thing works. That's an osprey. That's an osprey who's pissed off. 
but I'm gonna tie a loop knot on. My rule of thumb is that if I have to impart the action on the lure myself, I want a cinch knot. If the, the lure has its own action, I want a loop knot. And I know that's the kind of thing that people have different opinions on. What do you guys think? What should I be tying on this thing? Should it be a cinch knot or a loop knot? What do you guys do? How do you guys make a decision? It's not everybody gets to ask a couple of thousand people what their opinion is on tying a knot. Let's see what it looks like. Oh yeah, it's working. That's pretty amazing. I'm, you know, a lure like this can go, oh yeah, that thing's working can go both ways. It can become so unstable that it just sort of spirals in the water. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and it's totally erratic. I think my meager reeling speed is probably not enough for this beast. Let's troll it behind the boat. Here I'm using the trolling motor and it's set about medium low. You can see already that it has a tendency to wander all over the place, but you really got to get it going to really show how wide it'll actually sweep from left to right. Here I bumped up the speed a little bit. You can see a little bit more action. I think at this point I was going about as fast as that trolling motor will take the boat but you can definitely see an increase in action. It does get a little more erratic and we get a lot more movement left to right. All right, so I had the trolling motor going as fast as it would go and it just isn't really that effective. You need to have a lot of line paid out to get the big sweep. It has like a big sawtooth back and forth action. This is definitely a doable build. And my hat goes off to the early guys who developed this thing because I'm sure it took a bunch of experimentation to really get this thing right. This is the kind of lure that you can go completely wrong with, that you can make just a little off and it'll just sort of barrel roll on you. I think paying really close attention to the dimensions and to getting those nice square cuts made all the difference.